and and I had a sort of a esprit de corps with the president. I felt uh, empathy with him because I thought that this president, I say, he has within his heart uh, to uh, uh, willingness to bring about peace and equality and justice for all Americans. And that's what he was standing for. That's what he said in all of his speeches. And I got the impression in listening to, uh, uh, to him and the feeling that I felt within him that uh, he was very serious about this and very honest. And he proved that he was in many of the steps that he take to towards uh, uh, forming civil rights. And he was hated for that by the South, but he was loved for the stance that he took by uh, most of your Negroes and minority races. Let's stay on that civil rights tone just for a second. I have, um, I'm have i very honored, sir, because tomorrow coming to Laurentian University is Minnie Jean Brown. Now, Minnie Jean Brown, I'm not sure if you know, was one of the Little Rock Nine. Yes. And uh, I may have an opportunity to actually interview her about civil rights. Do you remember, well, let's ask, I want to ask your opinion, sir. Let's go back a few years to 1957. Do you remember the Little Rock Nine? Oh, sure, I do. Sure. Can we talk about that, sir? It's something we haven't brought up before. And I think it's important for the students that are listening right now to try and grasp somehow... Your achievements, your your battles, and your incredible fortitude to stick forward and come forward, um, I just can't say enough about it. And I think it's important for the students to recognize this. Yes, well, well you know, uh, the Little Rock Nine was in uh, 1957. And uh, uh, Eisenhower was president at, at that particular time, and Governor Oral Fabus was the uh, governor. Uh, at, at that particular time. Now, we had these uh, uh, nine uh, Negro children who, who had made application to go to school, and they were supposed to go to, uh, I think it was uh, Central High School, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Wasn't that? that yeah, that it was, was Central, I believe. In Little Rock, and, Arkansas. Uh, right, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, um, of course, uh, the, the governor... Uh, was they had set against it and did not want these uh, the Negro children admitted into the school with uh, with white children. And there came a time when uh, President Eisenhower actually had to nationalize the Guard Force down in Little Rock and have them escort these uh, young children into uh, the classroom. Well, we know that worked out very well because many of them became leaders there at the uh, uh, Central High School and went on to do some great things in, in journalism and uh, other uh, types of occupations. How did that affect your life in those days when you heard of this struggle going on, not only in the South, but it must have affected you personally, living even in Chicago in the North? Yes, well, you know, uh, just prior to that, we had the terrible uh, murder of Emmett Till uh, mm-hmm. down down in Mississippi, and that was on a lot of people's mind, all during the Little Rock crisis and the uh, bus rides and things like that. But uh, I, I tell you, uh, President Kennedy brought with him a lot of hope, uh, but they, during the late 50s and the early 60s it was a very uh, troublous time here in America. And and many of the people of my race began to, to lose faith in, in the Constitution and what it stood for so far as uh, my people were concerned. Absolutely. And uh, we were like uh, in the wilderness. I think that the whole country was in the wilderness, so to speak, in trying to solve a situation that they saw before them that could probably bring down this country if some remedy hadn't been found. And uh, we had a young man that came along, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who seemed to galvanize the thoughts and opinion of the majority of the minorities here in America. And he, uh, center, he became the center and attraction of a, of a movement towards an integrated society in, in which we now live today. Sir, in, when you became on the White House Secret Service, detail. Did you ever have any discussions about civil rights or anything outside of the Secret Service with anybody there, perhaps the President, Bobby? 
No, no, I didn't. I didn't discuss it as an issue, not not the uh, racism as an issue, although I, I experienced uh, quite a bit of it being an agent in, in the United States Secret Service. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, racism within the Secret Service itself, and there were comments that were made that I overheard. Uh, probably they weren't intended for me to hear, but... Uh, I heard the president uh, uh, referred to by some of his closest agents as a nigger lover, mm. and I heard two of them talking, and they were saying, and that this, this was going on in the White House, that if that the, anyone would take a shot at the president, uh, try to assassinate him, they wouldn't do their job. And this was mortifying to me. I couldn't believe I was hearing my ears. And the reason for that is that uh, some of these agents were from the South, and they were dead set against the policies and principles that the president stood for. Although uh, what they uh, were doing was a grave mistake because, see, the Secret Service is not really protecting a man. What we are protecting, when I was, uh, should have been protecting, was the, was the office, the official office, the constitutional office, of the presidency of the United States, which is above anybody that could ever come into that office. And in assassinating the president or talking against the president once that he was elected and calling him these different names, what they were actually doing was making it a personal thing, which your bodyguards and Secret Service can't afford to do that. We have to keep our eyes on the total prize, which was the constitutional of the of the uh, United States of America, and they were faltering on that. They were faltering on that. They were racist. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of my supervisors told me, Brent, yes. uh, when we were in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, he Harvey looked me Henderson. right in the eye. Yes, Harvey Henderson. Mm -hmm. He looked me right in the eye. And is it okay if I tell you all the exactly what he said? He Please. says, Bolden. He says, I'm going to tell you something. And don't you ever forget it. He told me, he says, you're a nigger, you were born a nigger, you're going to die a nigger, and you'll never be anything but a nigger. So act like one. Now, here is a man who is shoulder to shoulder with the president, who is standing on the side of the president's uh, uh, automobile with those type of, of sentiments uh, within the group itself. And so I found this to be very, uh, uh, very, very duplicitous, if nothing else. It must have broke your heart, sir, to know that people so close to a man held so in high esteem by yourself and the country, a man so close and responsible for his life would have sentiments like that. Yes, yes. Well, it, it, to me, it not only broke my heart, but I saw it. I saw it as a serious security risk. Absolutely. I saw it as a risk so so predominant that uh, before I left the Secret Service detail and went back to Chicago, I went into the uh, chief's office, U.E. Bauman, in Washington, D.C., and explained to him what I had seen and what I had heard. And also I warned the chief of the Secret Service that uh, the agents were, were reporting for work, drinking with, with and not really in any condition to protect the president of the United States. Some of them would be inebriated, having been up all night, and they were just, just, just in a terrible mood and uh, drinking on the job. They had a little cabin there at uh, Handsport, Massachusetts, where the agents were staying while that they were eating lunch or, or whatever. There was alcohol in those little, little houses, those watch houses. And so I, I thought that this was really a security breach that was endangering the president of the United States, and I made no bones about it because you have to understand this, Brent, that uh, I was a Secret Service agent sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. I, was not, I did not swear to uphold the Secret Service or to uphold anybody uh, who was doing something that would jeopardize that Constitution. So... I pitched my cards with the Constitution of the United States, which I had sworn to uphold. And that's the reason I got in trouble and, and had to serve time in the penitentiary. Because you were a stand-up man. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I stood up. 
see, I didn't go around backbiting. I, I, I let it be known when things would come up and about the protection of the president. I would remind the uh, supervising agents of, of what happened to me and what the agents had said concerning their hate for President Kennedy. And, and when they came to Chicago here in 1963, in March of 1963, and the agents went down on Rush Street and had a drinking session all night long and until about 6 in the morning, and the president was due here that night. And this, this was in March of 1963, just for several months. We, I castigated those agents while we were in a meeting, along with several of the uh, Ch Chicago policemen, and told them point blank, what's going to happen is that you're going to get the president killed. And I was ostracized because of my <laughs> attitude. And if you talk to any of those agents, there are a couple of them who are still alive. They will tell you that Bolden spoke out. He didn't bite his tongue when it came to the protection of the president of the United States. Sir, you talk about being ostracized. Have you been in contact with these fellow agents that you just spoke about since then? And have you been able to come to any terms with them? I have I have talked with a, a couple of agents, uh, some who are within the Secret Service now, and some who were in the Secret Service when I was there. And to a man, they all un understand uh, what happened to me and why it had to happen because uh, a couple of those agents are out of the Chicago office here, and they know exactly what I was saying. Although they declined my invitation to come out front, you know, and, and verify these things that I'm saying because uh, prior to uh, the um, release of many of the documents that, uh, that were declared uh, top secret by uh, President Lyndon Johnson, um, these people know that uh, I'm telling the truth and they could verify much of what I was saying. Prior to the release of those documents, people were trying to make me look like I was insane. But the release of the documents, yes, after the documents were released, I was talking about an investigation uh, that occurred in Chicago where people knew that the president was going to be assassinated, and people were saying, this guy's insane. No such investigation uh, uh, existed. And then the federal government the Congress investigated, and then certain documents were released and verified everything that I said. And, and so I have to keep on keeping on because there's a greater thing that's at, at stake uh, than just the death of one man or the death of me or the death of President Kennedy or, or anybody in my family. And that is the larger picture of the protection of the freedom, justice, and equality that we have under the Constitution of the United States. Yes, sir. Have any of those agents ever come to you and expressed any remorse for what happened to yes. you? Yes, they yes, yes. I, I talked I talk with one agent, uh, uh, it, well, shortly after I was released from, from the penitentiary, and uh, he testified against me at, at the trial, and he just came to me and said point blank that, uh, that uh, well, I had to do what I did because they put so much pressure on me. And I told him, I forgive you, man. I, I understand how those things go down, you, you know, because when the, so what the Secret Service did to me uh, and, and imminently and, and finally uh, made a better man out of me, if, if you would only uh, understand that, they made a better man out of me. What I went through uh, alerted me, and it brought me closer and closer to uh, the reality of what would happen if we lose these freedoms that we have under the Constitution of the United States? It made me a, 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 a more a willing to fight to preserve these freedoms from any and all enemies uh, of, of America. You see, sir, this is what makes you a great man, because you've taken that negative, horrible things happen to you, and you've turned into something positive. Instead of getting down on yourself... And letting that fester away at you, you've risen up beyond that. When you were down in the pit, sir, I know there were several things that took place. An act of intervention, a fire specifically. Yes. I was wondering if you could tell the folks about that. Yes, well, I was in uh, uh, 2-1 East. All of the uh, 
inmates at uh, Springfield, Missouri. That's a medical center in Springfield, Missouri. They call it, they have a name for this place, and they call it the tomb. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I was in in that two one East Sector Active uh, Division. And uh, they they're for the uh, worst of criminals, people who have uh, killed, murdered, and and have done all sorts of treacherous things. Uh, and uh, they most of them are, are incurably insane or haven't been made by the government as being uh, incurably in, insane. There's a lot of screaming at night, a lot of hollering and cursing that are going back there. And it's, it, it, it's just a madhouse, so they call it the tomb. And when they put me there, I was there. Uh, uh, my tenth day there, I remember just, just as, as clearly as I can. It was a, about the... Uh, 16th of July, and uh, I had this vision, and that there was a vision where I, I believe it was a holy angel from God. It couldn't have been anybody but a holy angel from God, and I do believe in the angels of God. But uh, he or she came to, to me in my room in a vision of light and told me not to worry that uh, I would uh, uh, be free from that uh, that stern uh, cell that they had me in and had me locked up for 10 days. They had me in there uh, without any clothes. I didn't have any clothes or shoes or shoelace or anything like that, and they hadn't let me bathe or come out of that room for 10 whole days. I couldn't turn the lights on or off. They did that from the outside. They flushed the toilet from the outside. And so uh, uh, there I was, and when I saw this vision, it, it told me not to fear, and that God had heard me, that, that God was with me. And the very next morning, the very next morning, there wasn't even uh, eight hours between the vision and, and daylight, I heard uh, uh, the fire bells ringing in the ward, and they they were ringing loud in the uh, uh, the. Um, Guards were running back and forth past my room, and uh, I knew that something was going on because I could smell the smoke. And I heard one guard ho- holler to another one that uh, there was a fire in one of the cells down near the end of the hall. And uh, this gu- this guard who was uh, still on his way there said, "Can't be," said, "We don't have anybody in there. It's been vacant." And he says, well, the room is burning. Everything in there was, was burning. The mattress and everything was a fire. And they couldn't figure out how that could be with nobody in there. And uh, so it made it necessary for them to come to my cell. And for the first time in those 10 days, the guard turned that key, and I walked out from behind that three-inch thick steel door into like it was almost like uh, making parole even though i was just walking into another lobby area of of that ward it was being outside was just like freedom man i i tell you nobody can tell you can really explain to you how it feels to be alone with nothing but your thoughts and the lights t- being turned out at seven o'clock nobody talks to you except those who want to give you some medication or the psychiatrists come by and talk to you through the door, and the guards push your blankets and things in through a little little uh, a slot in the door. It, it it just was horrible. It it was horrible, brother Holland, and and I wonder sometimes how I endured it. And and uh, after I came out of that uh, situation, as a matter of fact, uh, when they let me out, that ten days because of that fire, you know, they had to let me out. And uh, I sat across from uh, one inmate that I had seen, witness myself. He stabbed another inmate on the elevator that I was on, stabbed him to death, cut his guts out. And I witnessed this, and here I am. Uh, they put this in, uh, his inmate, uh, his first name was James. I won't say his last name, but uh, but uh, he, he, this guy come over and sat down, and we had a conversation about that day that he killed another inmate. Oh. And uh, <laughs> you can imagine how I felt at first when I recognized this guy. And <laughs> I was in there with him, you know, because I was on my guard and the silverware that we were eating with, yeah, I wasn't afraid that he could do anything with that because most of it was plastic or cardboard. But um, 
But we had a conversation, and, and I tell you, I wouldn't take anything for that experience. So it, it, it was a great experience for me. It, it was a learning experience, too. And I came out of it, uh, and for, for the uh, best of mankind, I believe, I have something to contribute to mankind. You certainly do, sir. What an incredible man you are. It is truly an honor to speak with you today. Folks, if you're joining us, Mr. Abraham Bolden, first African-American Secret Service agent, handpicked by John F. Kennedy himself. The Echo from Daily Plaza is the name of the book. It can be gotten right across the country at any chapter's indigo. Oh, Mr. Bolden. um, Can we counter this negative, as I always like to do, with a positive? Can we yeah. talk Thank you sir. Can we talk about your music career? Something we didn't get into the first time we spoke a year ago. Uh and you had a run in with history there too in your high school. Yes, I did. Yes, yes I did. Yes, I did. As a young man, I I had my my older brother uh Daniel uh went to Lincoln High School and uh he was in the uh, Lincoln High School marching band. He was about eight years older than me. He was, he was my larger, bigger brother. And uh, I used to like to go to band practice with my big brother because he would let, let me carry the bell of his tuba. He played bass <laughs> on, and it came apart with, the, with that big bell, and he would let me carry that. And I was so happy I would be walking along beside him, you know, and I, like I was uh, playing that horn. But anyway... I would go to band practice with them, and uh, when uh, they were practicing a march one day, that uh, and I was standing there listening to them, and uh, uh, Mr. Buchanan told the band to stop and go to another section and play another march, and that was this this young, skinny, uh, black guy, and he was sitting by the radiator, trumpet player, and every time that the rest of the band stopped, he would keep playing. Ha. And uh, he, uh, he would keep playing it, and he wasn't playing the march like it was written. He was jazzing it up. And <laughs> and, 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 and this this got on um, Mr. Buchanan, who was the director. He would call him and tell him, hey, hey, stop, stop. And he would beat on the, uh, on the podium and, uh, until he got the attention of this young guy. And so this happened several times while I was watching. So on my way back home, I asked my older brother, I said, who, who is that guy, who, that trumpet player back there who, who won't stop and who is playing, you know, when the band leader tells him to stop? He said, oh, I said, that's Miles Davis. So he got a brother that plays saxophone. Now, this was the Miles Davis who later became the Miles Davis. <laughs> and I'm telling you, uh, you, you know, and that kind of inspired me. I want to become a trumpet player, too, mm-hmm. which I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my my dad my dad forced me to take music. All of the children in the Bolden House in East St. Louis, we had to take music lessons when we reached the age of nine years old. Uh, he would make an appointment for us to take music lessons because he said music does something. It, it placates the soul, and you have to practice, and it gives you something uh, positive to do every day. And that's why he he ordered us to take music lessons. Well, I learned to play the piano, and mm-hmm. when he found out I was interested in the trumpet, I started playing the trumpet. I guess I was about 12, 13 years old, and they gave me private lessons. I became quite a trumpet player. Now, and uh, they call me the uh, musicians around town and uh, places where I was known to play. They call me Little Satch. And uh, the, as for Satchmo. little Louis Armstrong, sure, sure. Uh, little Satchmo. Now I don't know if they call me little Satch because I played like him or looked like him, but uh, <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> both both of us were dark complected because he was quite a bit older, and uh, they would call me little Satch. And I played around at the, the town with. Uh, uh, Edna Deal and Association in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And I met uh, at the uh, Showboat Club there. I met a lot of the musicians. As a matter of fact, I played with my, my wife, the bee's father, but I didn't know he was going to be my father-in-law later on, Eddie Hardy, who, 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 played, who was a drummer. But anyway, oh. I became quite a sensation. I went off to school, I majored in music, graduated cum laude, 
And you know, Brent, I did a really dumb thing what when I was in, in college. Yeah, you know, it, it, this was real dumb, man. We played a, a dance in uh, southeast Missouri. It's a little small town, the Charleston, Missouri, down there near Oh, sure. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charleston, Missouri, and, and and we played a dance one night. We stayed at this little room in the house called Kearns. He called it a hotel, Kearns Hotel. And uh, the boys, after we finished this little school of prayer, this, this dance that we played, we all got together and, and said that we were going to chip in and buy some booze. And uh, that's what I was in college, and, and that's what we all did. We sure. get, and this this booze that we bought now was the real stuff, man. This was corn whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this was the real stuff. I mean, I guess that stuff must have been 100 proof. And and uh, we we got this big bowl that uh, Mr. Kearns brought up there to us, man. We just poured a whole lot of stuff in there, pop and all that stuff, and stirred it around, you know, and and and, and uh, had a lot of great pop in there and stuff, you know. And that stuff was even bubbling on its own. <laughs> every now and then, every now and then, you'd see a bubble come up. <laughs> this stuff and this grain. Out. He didn't put a lot of grain alcohol in there. It was mostly, I thought, it was pop. But we'd start sitting around and we'd start talking and everything. You know how men do and oh, start sure, discussing sure, sure. different things. Yeah. And I'm sitting there with my little cup. See, I didn't drink much. I, my dad didn't allow me to drink it. But anyway, I said, well, I see you fellas. And I got up. And uh, the next thing I know, you know the, the floor hit me in the face. Uh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, it just, just hit me, man. Those I dirty floors. Yeah, the floor hit me in the face. <laughs> I thought, sure, I was standing up and the floor had hit me. But anyway, the guys escorted me to the room and, and everything, and they put me in bed. And and they tell me that I fought a couple of them because I don't, I don't remember, you know. But anyway, they finally got me in bed. Got my clothes off, and, and I woke up the next morning. It felt like somebody had a jackhammer on the top of my head, man. Oh, my head was killing me like a jackhammer. And so um, I went into this little shower room that, that he had at the current hotel, and, and uh, I started taking a shower. And and all of a sudden, you you know, I'm getting up off the floor, and I'm looking around. Who the heck hit me? You know, I'm looking around for some somebody in the, the water. I'm looking up, and I said, "That gum, there, there's a shower head way up there." You know, and I'm down here on my back. And uh, so I say, "Oh, you guys, you know." And, uh, and see, what I had done is took a drink of water uh, uh, right before I took that shower. And they say, "You should, I shouldn't have done that." But anyway, I'm there still in the shower again. You know, and then. And then the lights go out again, and I wake up. And so one of the band leaders come over there and say, man, what's the matter with you? He said, that's the second time. He said, oh, man, look at your mouth. You know what? I had knocked that front tooth up, oh, up in there, and it was no. bleeding like that. And I'm a trumpet player. I know. I had broke that tooth off, and it was up, and the rest of it was up in the gums. I had about, I would say I had about, uh, Three fifths of the tooth that was showing, oh, no. and my mouth was bleeding. So they took me over to a dentist there, and the and uh, the dentist looked at it and said, "Well, it might not be as bad as as it looked." He said, "That uh, tooth is knocked up; it might work its way back down, but the crack is going to be there." Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did when we got back to the campus at Lincoln University, I went to see the the, the dentist, and. Uh, I asked the dentist uh, uh, what he could do. He said, we can't do anything. He said, maybe give it a root canal, and then we'll see what happens, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I told him, well, uh, will I be able to play trumpet? He said, you should have thought about that before you drank that booze. Oh. Yeah, I said, I know, you know. And, and so it came back down sure enough, but uh, I I could never get my tone back again. That thing, would, when I hit a high note, I I I don't know just the pressure on it. Even after I had the mm -hmm, root canal, mm -hmm. even it, 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 the gum was sore, 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 oh. and uh, that was the end of a career, man.
just like and that. That was my my senior year in college. I still tried to play. I played a few dances and things like that. The people thought I was good, but they don't know how much more I had to exert to get the same sound that I had effortlessly before. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely, sir. Yeah, I'm yeah. a musician, as you know myself. I play the drums. So, sir, when we meet, and we will finally meet at one day, I promise, I want to jam. Oh, with. yeah. I want to jam. Really? With. Can we jam together, sir? Well, I don't play the trumpet anymore now. Do you play keys? I say, you, you know, the thing about it is, 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 is that I have one tooth left in my mouth. <laughs> one. And, and that, I mean, that, that's mine. That, uh-huh. That's, you know, I, I got more than that, but they're paid for, too. But anyway, I got one tooth, and do you know that that tooth hurts me? <laughs> it, started, it started hurting about a week ago. Oh, one no. tooth. <laughs> do you play piano, sir? <laughs> yes, I play piano. Then you play yes, piano? You play keys and open drum. How's that? I, I do that mostly for, for relaxation. And I just play around because uh, my sisters, I had two sisters who uh, were professional piano players. Oh, and wow. I had a brother who gave concerts all through uh, uh, St. Louis. And we just were a musical family, you know. But That's I always wonderful. loved law enforcement. It, it was, uh, I was enthused with it because we had a couple of men in the neighborhood. One of them yes, was sir. a guy they called uh, Leo Fats Gooden. And uh, he was a deputy sheriff and, uh, and a real nice guy, big, uh, big fat guy. He weighed about 450 pounds. Holy cow. And, you know, but everybody loved Leo. And then we had Lucius Hogan. Now, these people stayed about a block away from me, and they were like sort of the neighborhood mentors, you know, when their children would get in it, when children would get in trouble, sometimes the parents would go get one of them and have mm-hmm. you talk to this boy. You know, they, they mm-hmm. were like the, the policemen. Very well respected, and, and I admired them so much, and they impressed me. I, I really wanted to be in, be in law enforcement, and that's the choice I made. Now, I could have mm-hmm. stayed in music uh, after I graduated. They offered me a job in, in uh, southeast Missouri, where I had met my Waterloo, so to speak, and I was supposed to report down there for choir director. And, uh, of course, a job came through at Pinkerton National Detective Agency. Mm -hmm. I accepted that rather than go and accept the music job. Mm -hmm. And you were the first African-American at the Pinkerton outfit also, weren't yes, you? Yes, and yeah. isn't that something you know now? Now I I didn't I didn't know that I had no idea, and my wife happened to see uh, this Pinkerton job in the St. Louis Post Dispatch newspaper one Sunday. She was reading it, and at that time I was uh, considering uh, going down to uh, Southeast Missouri. She says, "Well, here's a policeman job that you were talking about. You might apply for a police job." Said that Pinkerton is looking for agents. Uh, for the detective range, and I told her, you know, I said Pinkerton's got a reputation. They don't, they don't hire no Negro agents, you know. She says, well, you never know. She says, take this uh, clipping out of there, and she cut the clipping out, and she says, why don't you go over there in the morning, and uh, and apply for the job. And so, oh, okay, but I tell you now, they're not going to hire me, you know. And so I put this clipping up in my the the, the lapel pocket of of, of my uh, Sears and Roebuck suit. I had, uh, had a nice Sears and Roebuck suit. Uh-huh. It cost me thirty nine ninety five with two pair of pants, man. And I was sharp too. I went absolutely. Uh, yeah, I went up to Pinkerton National Detective uh, Agent on the twelfth floor at seven hundred five Olive Street in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I walked in the office and I told a young lady who was sitting there uh, typing. I said, I came to feel a, a Pinkerton investigator job could you have open? And she looked at me and she says, we don't have anything open. And I told, uh, I said, yes, you do. And I, I gave her this clip and then uh, my wife had cut out of the paper and it said clearly that they were looking for an investigator. And she looked at me and said, we're not hiring people like you. Well, back there in those days, I knew exactly what she meant. She didn't have to elaborate, mm. and, and I wasn't going to give her any trouble, you know. And this was in 1956. I wasn't going to give her any trouble. Yes, sir. And uh, as I was turning around, getting ready to walk out of the office, this uh, tall, sandy-haired uh, uh, European walked out, and he asked the secretary, "Say, uh, what's the problem? 
And she said that uh, he came looking for a job, and I told her, we don't have anything open. And uh, he looked at her and says, yes, we do. And he said, he told her, said, give him my application and have him fill it out and then come talk to me. And so I filled out the application. I found out that this was the uh, district director of Pinkerton. Wow. And uh, he was there, and, and, and uh, I filled out the application. He looked it over, and he said, he asked me about my music career and everything, mm-hmm. and I told him what had happened. And, uh, and uh, he says, well, we'll give you a background check. That'll take about two weeks. And they called me up and told me to report to uh, Pinkerton, and I went over there, and he says, well, Mr. Boland, he says, I'm going to give you a chance. He said, now, do the best you can, because we don't have any Negro investigators in Pinkerton. And he says, by you being the first one, I'd be expecting uh, a lot from you now. And I said, I won't let you down, Mr. Mertz. That's right. And Mm. He gave me the job, gave me my badge and my star and everything, and I became a Pinkerton detective. Man, was I happy. <laughs> I couldn't wait to go tell Leo Gooden and, and Lucy about it. I showed them my little silver badge and everything that they gave me. And I felt real good about that. They must have been and so proud of partic- you. At that particular time, being the being the first African American w- wasn't very significant to to me. You know, I didn't go over there and say, I'm the first black man and all this kind of stuff. I, I mean, I, I I realized that it was a milestone, but I'm more proud of it now than I was then. Mm-hmm. Let's right. talk about what Pierre Salinger told you, sir. Oh, isn't that something? Yeah, that's uh, I was spending in. Uh, front of the president's office on on detail yes, on sir. post in Washington D.C. and uh, they were coming out of uh, the president and the cabinet were coming out of a meeting that they had had and I happened to be standing right outside the president's door and when Hubert Humphrey and Senator Barry Goldwater came out through the president's office door and they left it open. I reached in to close the door, and President Kennedy was standing in the office, and he was talking to, to his brother, Robert Kennedy. He looked up and saw me, and he came rushing over with his hands extended, and he said, Mr. Bowman, I see you made it here. And I, I was stalled. You, you know, he, he mm-hmm. remembered my name, and, and, and here he comes, and he's smiling from ear to ear and everything, and he called he would hump here over there and told him, I want you to meet Mr. Bowen. He's a Secret Service agent, the first uh, Negro, and this and that. And he said the same thing to Barry Goldwater. Then he took me to Evelyn Lincoln, introduced me to Evelyn, Evelyn Lincoln, and, and also Andy, who was the assistant press secretary. And here comes Pierre Solinger, and uh, he says, Pierre, uh, come over here. I want to introduce you to somebody. And Pierre came over and he said, I want you to meet Abraham Bolden. He said, he's the Jackie Robinson of the Secret Service. And I tell you, I almost burst into tears to be equated with a with an icon like Jackie Robinson. I mean, I, I, I felt so so good. I, I felt like the president was was really telegraphing, telegraphing to mean the fact that I would have to endure like Jackie Robinson did that he realized that uh, uh, what I was coming into and being a pioneer, that everything was not going to be, you, you know, pie and, and, and sweetness, you know. He realized that. And so I think by equating me with Jackie Robinson, I think that was the message that he was really uh, relaying to me rather than Pierre Salinger so much. Sir, mm-hmm. you have achieved that and so much more. Let's stay on some happy times your first time on Air Force One. Oh, wonderful. And I'm sure that the President Kennedy was the person that put me there because we were leaving the high sport on July the 5th. And after they celebrated the 4th of July down there, about the 5th of July. And uh, this same supervisor who had told me that I was nothing but a, a nigger, mm. he told me that I was assigned to the uh, President's uh, uh, Air Force One. Now, 
I knew that he would never put not 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 Harvey. He would never put me on Air Force One uh, unless it was on inside of one of the jets. You know, but uh, <laughs> I'm laughing and I shouldn't be. I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, really, really, he would put me under one of the wheels, maybe, but but not inside, you know. But he, anyway, uh, I'm sitting on Air Force One, man. I'm really looking at, at how it's laid out, all of the uh, equipment it has on it, and the president came out uh, out of his cabin, and as I was sitting there near the front of the plane, and he nodded to me, you know, and I nodded back at him. I said, man, this. This is really something, you know, being historical like this. And plus, I rode on a helicopter uh, uh, to get on Air Force One. I was about, I, I would say, let's see, uh, oh, maybe six inches from the president. He was wow. sitting, and our knees were almost touching. And I was sitting right across from him, you know, and I was looking right in his eyes, and he was looking, you know, around and and everything. You know, Brent? At one time, I, I, I started to uh, mention to him some of the problems that, that I had had, but I, I, I decided, I said, you know, that would really be out of the way because here's, here's a man, he's got Vietnam on his mind, he's got all of these problems of Russia and Khrushchev for them. Now I come mm. up and say, somebody call me black. You, you know, I mean, high insignificant. I, I felt that it would be best to handle that through the Secret Service, through the normal chain of command, and and in hoping that they would take some type of action, but they didn't. Did you ever talk about family issues or anything? Perhaps uh, your wife and your kids. Did he ask about those or those Are types you, of issues? On the Secret Service detail. Yeah, with President Kennedy. Did you have any personal conversations with him at all, sir? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I tell you, I talked to uh, Caroline, and she was a little young girl. And oh, uh, I want to get into Kennedy. that. Uh-huh. Yeah, Jacqueline Kennedy came out, and she had on a bathing suit, and she had a towel draped around her shoulder, and, and uh, little Caroline uh, uh, was with us. She had Caroline's out of hand, and I was uh, sitting at a table that had an umbrella open and two chairs, which was one of the uh, Secret Service posts near the beach. And she walked up to me and she says, uh, Mr. Bowler, would you watch uh, Caroline while I take a swim? I said, oh, sure, Mr. Kennedy. And she went off, you know, went on down by the water. And look, Caroline kept looking at me and she kept looking at me. And finally, finally, she says, uh, what's your name? <laughs> and I told, I told Abraham, you know, and she said, Abraham. I said, yeah, like Abraham Lincoln. And she said, "Oh!" And then she, uh, with a little little sand uh, uh, cup she had, which she was putting sand in it with a little spoon. And she stopped and she sat at the table across from me, you know. And she was looking inquisitive and everything. She says, "Do you have a daughter?" I said, "Yes, I do." And I said, "Her name's Avia." She says, "Can I play with her?" I said, "Sure, you can." I said, "But she's in Chicago." And uh, you, you were here, she says, I, I can go to Chicago. You know, so sweet. She was such a sweet little girl. And then uh, Jacqueline came back, and I heard her as Jacqueline as they were walking back up towards, uh, towards the main house saying, Mommy, can we go to Chicago? Aww. I thought that was so cute. That was so cute. We, she in her little pink uh, sand suit on. That's I don't beautiful. know if she remembers that. Yeah, oh, oh, I, I was very happy about that. And I wrote a letter to my wife and told her that uh, that uh, Carolyn Kennedy wanted to play with Avia. They, they're about the same age, you mm-hmm. know. And you know, I just <laughs> so it was just it was just wonderful. The Kennedys treated me, you know, so royally. I talked to Bobby Kennedy uh, while I was there in Hannesport, and he wanted to know why I didn't uh, uh, make the application for the FBI. Mm-hmm. And uh, I told him, you, you know, that uh, I didn't think I was qualified because I was not either a lawyer nor an accountant. And he says, oh, those type of things can be waived, you know. Yes, sir. And, uh, yeah, he told me to uh, look into it when I got back to Chicago. But in the meantime, the president, during the conversation, and asked me if I intended to make a career out of the Secret Service. And I told him that uh, not really. I really wanted to uh, be a diplomat or something uh, like that to one of 
uh, African nations. And he asked me if I spoke uh, uh, any of the African dialects. I told him no. He says, well, I tell you what, Mr. Bolden. He says, uh, you go to Burley's uh, language school there in Chicago. He said, I think they got one in Chicago or just outside of Chicago. Learn to speak one of those languages. Uh, and uh, who knows? He says, before I leave office, uh, I might help you fulfill that dream. And I told him, thank you, Mr. President. And I'm telling you, he, I mean, he was serious about this. Sincere, you know, and yeah. so was I. So was I. Do you still what have that? Incredible. Do you still have the yeah. aspiration, sir, to become, indeed, a diplomat? Well, I can't now because of the uh, felony conviction. What I would like to, uh, what I would like to see happen, is that uh, the current president, the Honorable uh, President Barack Obama? Yes, sir. Is that somehow or another that Holder investigates this case? That it, because there were, uh, there is much uh, evidence of my innocence in the Secret Service files. I know that would have to be because I never co committed any of the crime. Now, now I would hope that they would declare that uh, my conviction was unlawful, reinstate me to the Secret Service, and then let me resign. See, now that's the way I would I like see. to see it go. But the chances of that uh, happening, I, I think, are slim to none about, it, about as much as, uh, I mean, meeting the president at McCormick's place. <laughs> so, so, so there is that slight possibility, see, because a, a pardon mm -hmm. is, is one thing, but they want you to say that you committed a crime and that you're asking the president to pardon you uh, something like that. No, well, I, I might accept it, but I would never say that I did something that I didn't do. Good for you, sir. That courage of a great man. Sir, where is the case right now? Is there anybody, folks, that are listening right now can write to? Yes, they can uh, write to me at uh, www.echo from Dealey Plaza, D-E-A-L-E-Y, Plaza, P L A Z A dot net. Okay, that'll Make be it great. Go to my web. Yes, it will be. Sir, I have a slight confession I have to make to you. After go our right ahead. after our interview last year, I was so touched by your courage. I contacted Carolyn Kennedy and Ted Kennedy via email and sent them a copy of our interview together. Now, Is that right? I, yes, sir. I never mm -hmm. heard anything back from them. I'm just, I, and I know they received it because somebody had a sign for it. I am just wondering, and I had called them and explained uh, there was a wonderful little story, the one you just told about Carolyn, that I wanted yeah. her to hear. And uh, I was just wondering, has anybody ever contacted you from either one of those offices? I know Senator Kennedy's dead now, but I was no, just wondering. No, huh. and that's the strange thing. I yes, have sir. Had teachers. Teachers from, from Texas, there was a group of teachers from Texas. They wrote the president and asked that, that uh, something be done in my case. I know that people from Chicago have sent books to the, pre to the president and mm -hmm. to uh, Carolyn Kennedy and to Rory Kennedy, as a matter of fact, and, mm -hmm. and, but, but we never get a reply. And, and that's really odd because yes. when I was writing President Clinton, at, at, at least the people were getting something back that we we're looking into it, and uh, you, you know these times, uh, you know a form letter even. We're not even getting a form letter back. No acknowledgement whatsoever. That's exactly. And what that's weird. To you. It is. Any speculation as to why, sir? Well, I I keep uh, you know hope alive with with the idea that 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 let's say that they replied and said that we're looking into it. Well, that's a story in itself. And uh, if they said that we're not looking into it, and that's a story on the negative, which they would look for me to care before the, the, the public. You understand? Yes, sir. So, so when they, anything that they answer is going to generate a lot of publicity. So I think really it's, it's, it's good for me that they're not abruptly telling people uh, sending them a letter saying that this case went through uh, the, the procedures and through the Supreme Court and there's nothing more that we can do. 
See, I'd, I'd rather they not answer and investigate something secretly mm-hmm. and come to some conclusion than to, uh, than to give me that uh, final answer that nothing can be done. I see, sir. How about in terms of a feature film being made about your life story? I know I've been in contact with a very famous filmmaker. His name is Mark Sobel. He's done a film called The Commission, which is on the Warren Commission, and we've been writing each other back and forth. I had suggested to him about doing a feature film, and um, I was just wondering if there's any developments there, sir. Yes, we have a, a few developments that, that are coming uh, along. Uh, the Excellent. first thing that we're having done at the present time now is having the uh, script writer to, uh, to prepare a script. And he already has about uh, three, at least three actors out there in Hollywood that he's going to uh, uh, present the script to. And uh, we, we're on that, and he's, I guess he's about finished. He's been working on it for a couple of months now. And we'll go from there. In the meantime, I have had some feelers from some other uh, production managers and uh, movie people. As a matter of fact, at the JFK convention that I just came from, there were a couple of uh, producers there who said that they would be contacting me and see about getting this into a screenplay. Fantastic. And it's about time. Sir, if you ever need music, no problem there, my friend. I'd be more than happy to and honored to write a score for you, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, I guess we're going to have to start to wrap up now. Is there anything, sir, that you would like to leave the people with? Well, what I would like to uh, leave the people with is is this, is that when trouble uh, occurs, when such uh, uh, things happen, like the assassination of presidents or leaders, heads of state, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, whoever it is, we have to stand up and be alert. We who want to stand for democracy, we that want to stand for equality and justice, we can't just stand up when things just affect us alone. We have to stand up wherever we find corruption in a democratic process. And, and that's our obligation to uh, to the American people. It's our obligation to our children, and it's our obligation to God to be the best people that we can be while we're on this planet Earth. That's beautiful, sir. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir, on our show. And I just want to wish you God bless and all the very best thank always. You. Thank you for having me very much. Thank you. I'll be in all touch right. again, sir. Thank you so much. Good day. Bye, sir. Abraham Bolden, ladies and gentlemen, what an incredible, incredible man.